Michael Suker is the Assistant Minister to the Treasurer. He's my guest this evening. Welcome to the program and congratulations on your new baby. Oh, hi Patricia. Great to be with you and thanks very much. Now, today the big banks responded to the government's plan to tax them $6.2 billion over the next four years. They had until midday uh, to comment on that proposal. NAB and Commonwealth say the levy can't be absorbed and Westpac wants large foreign banks included. Do you think large foreign banks should be included? Are you willing to look at that? Well, Patricia, I'm not going to um, to make a call on that tonight. Um, obviously, um, you know... Suggestions such as those, I think, in any uh, consultation with the industry, would be uh, would be at least taken on board. But uh, the reality here is, no one expected that the banks would be particularly excited about this levy, and we didn't think that they'd be doing cartwheels with happiness about it. But the reality is, Patricia, we have a regulatory regime uh, in Australia that provides the banks with what is been estimated as anywhere between 20 and 40 basis point competitive advantage. I mean, we've obviously got the, the four bank the, the four bank policy, uh, the four pillars policy, which has been, um, you know, both sides of politics have supported that, uh, which gives the big four um, an inherent place in our economy, inherent advantages um, in uh, in the economy and. We think it's absolutely reasonable, given that 20 to 40 basis point uh, competitive advantage that they have, that on behalf of taxpayers in an environment where we are obviously trying to uh, get back to budget surplus as soon as we possibly can, uh, that they should make a contribution okay. to that budget repair process. We all know you want them to make a contribution, but they've made it clear today that they can't absorb it, which of course means... People pay for it, customers and shareholders. Does this concern you? Well, Patricia, let's put this into context. Um, their annual profits are $33 billion, uh, and the annual um, levy represents about $1.5 billion. So um, I would, again, expect the banks to, uh, in a sense, be particularly excited about uh, this measure. I don't, didn't expect that they're... Um, response to the government would be glowing and saying, thank you very much, we're so pleased with the levy. Uh, so in a sense, I think their, their reaction is not entirely unexpected. Um, but we have an ob obligation to Australian taxpayers and Australian citizens first and foremost. And, of course, uh, we will do everything we can to ensure we have a robust, stable... But all you seem to be able to banks. do so far is to say to people, vote with your feet. I mean, because you can't do anything, can you? You're putting on this levy, it's going to be passed on to customers and effectively people have to wear it. Well, um, of course we're saying vote with your feet. I mean, if, if your bank does something you don't like, that's what you need to do. I mean, let's, again, put this into some context. But you when... know it's not particularly easy for people to change banks. Well, Patricia, um, if you look at um, interest rate rises in the not-too-distant um, past, where we've seen the Reserve Bank raise interest rates by 25 basis points, and then the banks, uh, in some cases, not all, but in some cases, banks will raise their interest rates by 40 basis points, um, lots of consumers uh, say, well, <laughs> we're going to vote with our feet and move to another bank, a bank that hasn't. Uh, in a sense, ra raise their headline interest rates above the 25 basis point reserve bank um, uh, rate rise. And uh, this is, in a sense, no different. Um, the banks that, uh, in a sense, uh, absorb these costs are going to be at a competitive advantage to those that don't. And in a healthy, competitive market, uh, that's what you'd expect. Do but you again, take some responsibility, though, if customers are forced to pay higher fees, given it's your policy? Well, what we will take responsibility for is the fact that we will, on behalf of taxpayers, be receiving an extra $1.5 billion per annum to fund... Which taxpayers to, are going to have to pay to, for if they have to pay for it in higher fees. Well, so that's... A, I mean, that is a very... an extra tax on taxpayers rather well, than the banks if they pass it on. Patricia, you're making a very eloquent argument in favour of uh, corporate tax cuts, uh, business tax cuts, which is obviously what we have been progressing over recent months and with success, um, you know, very recently with tax cuts 
for businesses up to fifty million dollars. So I, I mean, I I appreciate those sort of arguments, but they they need to be made consistently. And uh, I think uh, anyone making those sorts of arguments are, in a sense, arguing for for all sorts of um, reductions in personal and income tax. And you know, I look forward to those arguments being made to the opposition leader. Uh, well, it's, it's not an he... argument, it was a question. If you're just tuning in, I'm speaking to Assistant Treasurer Michael Suka, and our number, if you want to text in, is 0418 226 576. Given the news poll result this morning, was the shift in the budget, the approach to spending, the increase in taxes across the board, a misfire? Well, Patricia, I mean, I think your question presupposes that um, that individual actions taken by the government are done for purely um, popular reasons. I mean, if you... Um, if the hallmark of coalition governments is that... Um, <laughs> I suppose, perversely, we've been a very successful political party for, for many years, and we've governed this country for two-thirds of the time in which the Liberal Party has been in, in existence. Uh, but we don't take individual decisions... Uh, in an isolated sense, to try and get budget, uh, to get poll bounces, or to be, or to ingratiate ourselves with any particular group. This is a prudent budget. We're we're very, very determined to get back to budget surplus by 2021. Uh, there's always economic headwinds, particularly in a very volatile global economic environment, and we were singularly focused on ensuring that. Uh, we did that, that we maintained strong growth in the economy and that we ensured that we had strong, um, continued strong jobs growth. I mean, these were the things that we were focused on and at the same time we are focused on ensuring that uh, programs like the NDIS could be funded. We can't just blindly hope that the numbers are going to add up at some point in time. We had to make them add up. We obviously inherited a very difficult set of books from the Labor Party and I mean, even till today, Bill Shorten denies that there's a, a, a budget black hole with respect to the NDIS. Well, I can tell you, there is a black hole, $55 billion to fund the NDIS. And we took a very difficult decision on the Medicare levy to ensure that that black hole was plugged. Uh, these are decisions that we don't take lightly, um, that we don't revel in, but um, in a sense, in a budgetary sense, the coalition, uh, we're the adults in the room and we've got to make these numbers work because we know Labor never will. Labor is okay. a party of higher debt, L let's high just, deficit, let's, and just whack on the credit Let's just park the, the extreme Labor <laughs> rhetoric so we can get to some of your policies. Sure. I want to talk to you about housing affordability because it was your other baby. I know you have a real baby now, but it was your baby that you worked on with the Treasurer throughout the budget process. Yeah. Are there measures that you're still wanting to explore that didn't make it into the budget because many have argued that this is just tinkering around the edges. Is this the beginning of the housing affordability path and policy response or is it the end? No, I mean, there's a sense in which all of these types of um, policy areas, uh, you know, there's a continuum and, and we don't ever say, OK, job done. Uh, I disagree with your opening comments. I mean, if I look at... Um, the reaction we've received from stakeholder groups, uh, whether they be uh, groups advocating for first-time buyers or groups in the community housing sector or groups that deal with homelessness or um, pr uh, property uh, property groups that really uh, focus a lot, of, a lot of their attention on getting more supply into market, most of them have, have actually been very positive towards the housing affordability package. Now, none of them have said it's tinkering. They've said this is... Uh, the most comprehensive plan that a federal government has ever uh, put in place with respect to housing because, I mean, let's not forget, Patricia, in a sense, we are encroaching on the what has historically been the territories of state and local governments who have got primary responsibility. Sure, but is there more to do? There's always more to do. And I can... I, I mean, I'll be really honest with you, there are some... Uh, further ideas that, uh, that the Treasurer and I will be keen to progress in the coming months. Um, we think um, what we landed on budget night was really comprehensive. It covered the spectrum of housing from first-home buyers to renters to those in community public housing, uh, those suffering from homelessness. And that was, in a sense, the mark we'd set ourselves. We said, you know, yes, the politics of, of, of housing 
as you know, Patricia is, you know, a lot of it's focused on first home buyers. That's where most, um, you know, most journalists and most news stories are focused on. But, you know, in having a look at the problem and seeing people in community and social housing, uh, the 30% of people sure, who are Sure, they're, rent, they're who the are, people are who are ignored. struggling. So you say Correct. you and the Treasurer want to work on some other measures over the coming months. Can you give me an idea of where you see weaknesses still in this area? Well, I don't, I don't see there being weaknesses. What I see there, though, is, as I said, this is a continuum and there's always more that can be done. I mean, I'll be, my energies over the coming months will be getting what we announced in the budget legislated. I mean, perversely, the Super Saver Scheme, which will provide for an average income earner a $7,000 tax cut, which instead of going to the ATO will go into their first home saver account. Seven thousand dollars instead of going to the tax office. You're right. We'll they get it. So, so on that, we, we, this I mean, morning, the Labor Party of sorry, Patricia, the Labor Party have said they are going to block a tax cut for first home buyers. So my energy is going to be in ensuring that we get that legislated. Okay. This so, morning, uh, the treasurer said he wanted more people to leave the rental market and buy homes because it was crowding out disadvantaged people in the in the rental market. Having those people there, given that's his rationale, do you have modelling? For how many people you expect to use this new super deposit scheme to buy their first first home? Any numbers? We we do we do have modelling, and we've in the budget modelled that this will um, this will cost the budget two hundred and fifty million. So, <coughs> but it's an open scheme, Patricia. So, um, if more people take it up, um, it will it will. So, how up. many first home buyers do you expect to buy new homes with this scheme? Well, how many? Well, we don't model how many we expect to buy um, because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, for people uh, who enter into a super saver scheme, they have, well, they'll have different savings rates. Um, you know, for some people, they'll be able to avail themselves of the $30,000 cap pretty quickly. For other people, it'll take a lot longer. For some people, too, they'll be um, one half of a couple. And so for couples, it's 60000 rather than thirty. Uh, we We don't... What we don't want to try and do is be too prescriptive about uh, how and when uh, this occurs because if we look at a, a similar, uh, the, the Labor scheme, which was their first home saver account, that it, they basically failed for two reasons. They failed because the tax incentives weren't, weren't good enough. So there wasn't enough incentive for people to actually avail themselves of the policy. And secondly, they were complicated. They required people to go set up a whole new bank account. And as you've sort of alluded to with your questions on banking, uh, portability in, in yeah, Australia, right. and, you know, moving banks is difficult. So okay. this is why we've chosen, this is why we've chosen uh, to do it through people's existing superannuation because it doesn't require you to go out and set up anything else. And okay. the incentives are quite extraordinary. Just a final question because I've gone over time. There's another story trending today. 35-year-old property developer Tim Gurner told 60 Minutes last night that young people have unrealistic expectations of the property market. He said, when I was buying my first home, I wasn't buying smashed avocado on 19 bucks and four coffees at $4 each. Of course, Bernard Salt made the smashed avocado, you know, thing <laughs> famous. Is that helpful advice, though, telling young people not to buy a four-buck coffee? <laughs> Well, can I say, as someone who... Uh, look, I'm 35 myself, so I'm not ancient. By and do you age. buy four-buck coffees? <laughs> well, um, do I you? do. And as you know, sometimes in, in, uh, in Canberra and Melbourne, they're more than four bucks, yeah. unfortunately. I got stung um, with a five-buck one. I'm still recovering. <laughs> My Look, and I speak to first-time buyers all the time, and I've obviously, in relation to the Super Saver Scheme, in crafting that, has spent a lot of time with prospective first-time buyers. So you buyers. don't think the $4 coffee advice is particularly helpful? Well, mate, well, most of them, most of the people I speak to are more disciplined savers than I ever was, and more disciplined savers than many people I know. So I think young people trying to get into the market understand the sacrifices that need to be made. And um, uh, look, I just, in a sense, I just don't see that being something that needs to be preached to anyone that's looking to buy a house because. It's always been difficult to get into the market, always been difficult to get your foot on the property ladder. And I suppose what we've been really focused on in this budget is to make sure it doesn't get any harder. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks so much, Patricia. Take care.